Champion Prairie School District 204 on Monday, August 7th, 2023. Michelle, will you please call the roll? Ms. Gintz? Here. Ms. Fazek? Here. Mr. Karubas? Here. Ms. Deming? Present. Mr. Rising? Here. Ms. Donahue? Here. And Ms. Jane? Here. We have a quorum. Ms. Deming, will you lead us in the pledge? and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our next regular board meeting will be held on Monday, August 21st. We have a couple of board salutes today, Ms. Jane. Key Club Scholarship Awards. The board salutes several District 204 students for re receiving Key Club Scholarship Awards from the Kiwanis Club of Naperville. The recipients are Matia Valley Senior, Rikita Badula, and Wabanzi Valley Seniors, Subu Mutia and Aditi Sasikumar, and Barth Tucker. The scholarships were funded through generous donations from the Kiwanis Club of Naperville. The students were recognized for their volunteer leadership and community service as members of the Kiwanis Key Club, as well as their scholastic achievements. Congratulations to all involved. Ms. Gantz. District 204 teacher appointed as a member of the Illinois State Board of Education. The board salutes Georgetown Elementary bilingual second grade teacher, Laura Gonzalez, on her appointment by Governor J.B. Pritzker as a member to the State Board of Education. Congratulations, Laura, on this stellar achievement. We have no public comment, is that correct? Okay, we will move to our consent agenda and superintendent report. We will start with the superintendent report, Dr. Talley. Thank you, Ms. Donahue, members of the Board of Education and the Indian Prairie community. Um, Tonight, as this is the last meeting before we officially begin school, I want to share some information. Summer Boost programs ended last week. Here again, staff and students were very pleased with this program. I was able to see students in this program and saw them engage with each other and with their learning. Our three high schools offered a bridge program this summer. This program supported incoming ninth grade students, helping them transition from middle to high school. It was well received. Thursday, August 24th is the opening day of school. Are you ready? The district will be ready to receive students and start instruction on the first day. Parents who are still in the process of registering, please finish your registrations as soon as possible. Registration does have an impact on staffing in our schools, especially at the elementary level. As I mentioned at the last meeting, a multitude of construction projects were started and completed this summer. The flooring work at Brookdale, Gombert, Patterson, and Prairie Preschool uh, have been completed. Students, staff, and parents will see new flooring throughout the school to include the media center, classrooms, and hallways. The gyms in these schools were not touched this summer. They will be done later. The work on the gym floors at Steck, Welch, Collishaw, Bilta, May Watts, and Fry is, are, is in progress. These gyms will be completed in time for the start of the school year. Many other construction work has been done this year and at a future board event meeting, they will, there will be a complete update with pictures. We continue to seek out those who can work as teaching assistants for the district. We know that there is a national shortage of those who are filling teaching assistant position. Teaching assistants work directly with students and support them in their endeavors. If you have the time or you know someone who does, please contact your child's school or our human resource officers. Flexible hours are available for people by working part-time or full-time. Not having these positions filled impact our, our students and our teachers and the rest of the staff who must cover for these vacancies. I will end my comments by sharing some good news about our mental health clinics. We have been uh, told that we are gonna receive some additional funding for the next two years that will allow us to continue our mental health clinics that we established last year. Currently, we have clinics at Matia and, um, um, and Niqua Valley, and we had clinics um, uh, at 
our Granger, Longwood, Fisher, and Georgetown. We'll be able to continue those for the next two years. I cannot speak about what the funding source is, but more information will come out later. So I'm very happy about that. I'll now turn the meeting back over to Ms. Donahue. All right. We now need to approve our consent agenda item. I need a motion for the approval of consent agenda items D through K. I move that we approve the consent agenda items D through K. I second. Any discussion? Michelle, will you please call the roll? Ms. Deming? Aye. Ms. Gintz? Yes. Mr. Karubas? Yes. Mr. Rising? Yes. Ms. Donahue? Yes. Ms. Jane? Yes. And Ms. Fosdick? Yes. Motion passes. We will now have a presentation by Dr. Lewis Lee regarding the ESSER 3 funding. Good evening. All right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so tonight is a night of firsts. It's my first one in this role. It's also the night of last. The last time we'll be doing this type of presentation for our ESSER three funding. Um, good evening, President Donahue, board members, Dr. Talley. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present tonight uh, to um, discuss our ESSER three uh, budget update. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, this tonight fulfills our requirement as a recipient of these federal, uh, these federal funds um, received from a grant source that um, allows us to not only display full transparency in how the funds are used, but also uh, to uh, seek um, public input from our community and then also uh, a full, uh, not only obviously is this presentation available online, uh, but one of the slides that outlines our full budget is also available online for our general public uh, in this final year as well. And uh, if there are any uh, questions about our budget, please, uh, members of the public or in our community, feel free to email me directly. Uh, for tonight, we're going to present several topics uh, for discussion. Uh, they include a recap of the funds as it relates to some of our surrounding districts. Uh, programming and activity for which the funds were used. Uh, we're also going to have a quick snapshot look at some of our current summer programming. Um, Dr. Talley uh, gave us a little snippet of, of some of those programs. Uh, and then finally, just next steps and challenges uh, for existing program in the final year uh, of our ESSER 3 funds. Uh, before we start, I want to make sure I, I thank several people who have been really instrumental in not only helping us um, really process these grants and secure them down to the penny, but also just helping the overall uh, uh, outcome of them. Uh, first, Dr. Tara Bell, uh, Don Forkner, uh, Don Monkman, uh, Candy Michelli, uh, all of our principals involved in our Freedom School grants, which I'll be talking about uh, shortly. And then uh, Ms. Joan Peterson, uh, who's really been helpful with our summer boost program that I'll expand upon, and then also Dr. Mike Purcell, uh, who's been uh, very instrumental uh, in working with our bridge program. So uh, the first slide up here, um, as I talked about, uh, really shows uh, not just the allotment of our, of our funds, but um, the progression of, of each year and how we received those funds. Um, the first round of funds that we received was the CARES uh, grant ESSER 2 was the second round, and we are finally in the, in the third round, which is our ESSER 3 funds. Uh, you'll see, and, and I'll um, talk a little bit about this later, uh, the amount that's up there for ESSER 3, um, the amount we received is actually higher, and that's due to the state's reserve of federal funds uh, that they uh, were also included on, and then that was allocated to districts. I'm not exactly sure the calculation in which the state used that, but I can tell you all of the districts in the state of Illinois uh, all operated with extra funds that the state was responsible uh, in giving those out. What you see on this slide is just um, a listing of us as it compares to other large school districts, uh, not just uh, obviously our neighbors 203, but Oswego's up there, Plainfield 202, uh, and what it looks like uh, as it relates to them. 
This next slide uh, is really what I um, want to speak a little bit more about. Uh, these, this is a slide that the board has, uh, we've shared with our public before. Um, while uh, we are always um, grateful for any funds that we'll receive through grant works, uh, this slide has always been a challenge for us as a district. Um, it relates, first shows our comparables, our, our eight comparables that we have up there. And uh, what, what stands out right away is that of our comparables, we have the, the second lowest allotment, and that's on a per student basis. Um, the reasoning and the rationale behind this is when the federal government was allocating these funds, they took a one uh, snapshot in time uh, and looked at, at poverty levels. Um, probably not the, the best way to look at this uh, because while even though we, we've been on a decrease enrollment, it, our enrollment in terms of especially uh, our students from different uh, socioeconomic status it has, has continued to remain the same. Um, this, as I said, is, 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 is hard to look at when you see all of our other districts. Uh, that being said, um, what I really also want to focus on tonight is how we've been able to take the monies that we've had and the, the large number of, of great programming that has come out of this um, over the past three years and, and working uh, with all of the staff has, has been really good. Another thing to mention, um, and Matt Shipley, our CSBO, talked a little bit about this at the July 17th meeting, is you know, we were hopeful that um, we would see an increase in our Title I funds uh, because we knew new census data was coming out. Um, the board may remember uh, over a year ago we were at about 800,000 uh, and, and Matt disclosed that we're at about 1.7. So that is really good news because we, we do anticipate that that will help us in moving forward with, with some of the the uh, continued programming that we wish to do. So when you look at um, our ESSER three funds, uh, it's actually part of what the federal government calls the American Rescue Plan, or ARP for short. Uh, again, uh, this, these funds were provided to um, school districts across the nation to help them reopen uh, safely as a result of the uh, pan pandemic. Um, as I mentioned, you can see in this slide, um, while we received an, uh, an original allocation of just under 8.5 million, that additional um, 870,000 was uh, the, the, the monies that I mentioned earlier from the state. Uh, so that brought our total to uh, just close to 9.5 million. And 20% of that original allocation has to be used by an LEA, the local education agency, to address learning loss, and we'll talk about that. Uh, also, you see in that pie chart that's taken directly from ISB, um, we have to, to look at some of that for after school programmings, and then finally, summer enrichment. Um, as a point of pride, we are well above that 20% that we've used to alloc uh, the allocation to address learning loss, uh, and then 71% of that uh, remaining allocation, um, we've really used for, uh, a lot for transportation as well. Uh, and again, as I'll talk a little bit later about some of those summer programming, those are programs where we've been able to provide busing uh, so that that's not a barrier uh, for student enrichment. Uh, transportation, we wanna remove as many barriers as we can. Um, let's talk a little bit about indirect allocation. So uh, in the ESSER three funds, we had an indirect allocation of of just under 13%. And what that means is for, it's common for all grants to uh, have in there where indirect funds, and, and really what that allows um, you to do is it gives some flexibility in terms of budgeting for programming uh, so that if a program that you're budgeting for comes in a little bit high, that you have that indirect funding to help assist with that. Um, it also helps with just the um, administration of the funds themselves. We don't have to list every single item. So for example, um, you know, we may have quarterly expenditure reports in which we have to um, submit uh, to show how those funds are being used. Um, if we were to look, for example, at some of these funds were used for our permanent subs in which we were using those, um, without that indirect funding, we might have to list every single one, of not only their names, but uh, also the amount daily that they were using, and, and all of those can be 
eat up costs and administrative tasks for us. So um, as a comparison, when we get title funds, uh, title fund grants, uh, that's indirect amount is usually around 2%. So to have about almost 13% uh, to, to really address some of those has, has really been helpful for us. Um, you know, um, when we, um, those indirect payments, uh, I should mention, really a, amounted to just around a million dollars in which we were able to. Uh, this next slide uh, is a, a, a breakout uh, by programming, by uh, activities of how uh, the amounts of the ESSER three funds were used. Again, as I said earlier, this is posted on our website um, so that the public has a full transparency of, of how we use just under $9.5 million of our ESSER three funds. When you look at this, um, uh, some of our Freedom School grant funding, uh, CARES and SEL were all grants that we applied for, and when you when you look at some of these critical positions that we have up there, I think one of the, the first questions that may come to mind is, is what are we gonna do uh, after this year? And I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, I, I think we'll continue to work very closely with the business office. I know uh, this board has, has and, and our cabinet team has made it a priority to really look at the top three that are up here and We've uh, already been able to, um, um, to sec secure some confirmations in the budget uh, process that uh, we believe those top three will definitely remain. Part of that is, has been a commitment by this board to continue to reduce class size at the elementary level. And then um, the coordinator positions has really been instrumental, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about those as well. Um, we want to continue to find ways to keep our nurses full time. Uh, we have our students with diabetes. Uh, it's really important to be able to provide those services, and um, I think we'll continue to have to look for those. You'll see on this budget. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that we've been able to do over the summer, like sending books uh, home to all of our uh, uh, K through five students. That is something that, based on um, the ex expiration of these funds, that may not be able to continue. So it's possible that some of the funds we may be able to stretch out to 2024 through 2025, and that's typical when grants and they expire, uh, just a little bit of extra time that's, that's allowed for that. Um, this will continue to be a challenge for us that we'll uh, continue to, to talk through the year about. So let's take a look at, at one of those um, slices of the pie that I put up there earlier, and that was how and what did we use to really support learning loss. So that amount up there, about just over 6.3 from federal and state grants, as I said, well above. Um, you must have a requirement to spend at least 20%, and we were well above that. Um, as you look at the um, elementary teachers, um, to reduce cl class size, we were able to put 12 teachers currently um, on our payroll for that. The summer boost program that Dr. Talley mentioned earlier, uh, we have more than 60 teachers currently as part of that program, and it's just been an amazing uh, sight to see. Uh, these are actually some of those the pictures uh, in which they were actually able to use uh, some of those um, dollars and funds to actually help uh, with a summer reading program that was taking place. We also, um, our middle schools being able to give some of our low income students um, summer support. Um, you saw on the previous slide and even here our iReady assessment, uh, spending just under 200000 for that. Um, is also an assessment tool that the CARES grant also helped pay for. And we're in, I believe, starting into our second or third year with that assessment. So starting to see um, for our staff uh, some, some really uh, great tools in which we can continue to see how our students are growing and they're learning. Uh, and then again, uh, the math coordinator positions. Uh, and, and again, Matt uh, really uh, shared just the good news about 
our title grant funds, which we think is going to be helpful in a lot of these programs. Uh, the remaining funds, when you look at um, just under two million, um, a lot of this um, was taking a look, not just uh, some of our nurses that I talked about, but um, Title I uh, transportation funding that was used. Um, I think we were, we're also, um, as we have our nurses in the, in the buildings, we want to be able to prioritize uh, not only our health and safety uh, for all of our students, uh, but all of our students who are especially medically at risk um, for different, um, um, different things that, the, that they are working on. Our ESY buses are not paid out of this grant. Uh, that being said, I think uh, any needs that we have for transportation, uh, working with uh, the business department has been really critical in making sure that we are um, not having transportation as a, as a source for any type of barrier. And again, uh, the indirect amount uh, that I mentioned earlier was, was just over one million, and you can see that in this slide. So let's talk about really this summer. Uh, this summer has been an amazing time for our students. Um, really some of the things that we wanted to do um, was to provide all of our students from early childhood to, to fifth grade with a, a just a cornucopia of books that they could take home and then also uh, expand the summer enrichment opportunities. So I want to just take this moment just to really highlight some of the great things because our buildings have been busy this summer. Uh, our teachers have been busy uh, and our students continue to be in our buildings at a critical time so that we can present any type of summer slide that you always read about, but also helping students to, to get ahead as much as they can. So those summer totes uh, were always a hit with our families. Uh, they, you know, to, to be able to take all these books home uh, and to see some of the smiles on the kids' faces and, and it really not only promotes obviously reading, but it's pr promoting that family time in which they can actually spend that time. They are asking, we're hearing stories, hey, you know, mom, dad, sit down, read with me. I've got these books, let's open them up. And we know those, that's critical. Uh, and not just for the academic component, but the social, uh, emotional learning component as well. All of that time that they're spending uh, is, is time that is well spent and we hope that that will just carry over not only with, their, with what they're doing on their own time but also as they come back to school ready for learning. Um, they have not skipped a beat with that. So uh, the two main other programs really at our middle school, at our elementary level and our high school is really a summer boost program. So we offered it to just over 525 students and uh, they were receiving two hours of instruction uh, that was also in math, student engagement, literacy, and, um, and they also were offered online Zoom sessions with instructors. This, um, while, you know, that number of offering it to over 525 students, I would love to be able to sit up and tell you that we had every single one of them. Uh, the challenge is also, you know, it, it's summer. And that's the flip side of this coin. Uh, a lot of people have one to take other types of um, opportunities for their families. And uh, that continues to be a program that we are going to continue to look at. How can we increase the number of students who are taking advantage of this? The free transportation is there. Uh, the excitement of coming to school is there. Uh, and also not just being totally focused on academics, but the other pieces that are just important is also there and our teachers are doing that. So we're gonna continue to evaluate this program just to see what else we can do uh, because we, we do believe it, it is critical uh, for all of our students. Our summer bridge program um, has been, uh, continues to be a success at all uh, three of our high schools, some quick numbers, uh, and I want to thank, thank Dr. Purcell uh, for providing this. We had just over 145 students who took part in this summer bridge program across the three high schools, which is amazing. Um, when, uh, when you look at our bridge program, it's being held for a total of 12 days, so they're coming in four days a week uh, uh, for three weeks straight, uh, and the focus for the students is really to help um, increase their confidence uh, make them more comfortable as they transition to high school. Uh, and again, we're not just focusing on academics. There's a combination of SEL that's just as important 
um, direct instruction that this board uh, made sure that was part of not only the board goals but but in our strategic plan and so all of that uh, has just is just made for some not only great um, um, uh, success but you know we were even getting emails from parents just thanking us uh, you know obviously for sending their students out the house for a couple hours but also just for what they've seen the difference in their son or daughter and and as those emails come in that's a source of pride uh, not only for the teachers and the administrators that are involved with this programs but um, for everyone who who has prioritized uh, making sure that this this bridge program continues to be something that, that is a source of pride for our district. We talked a little bit about the Freedom Schools grants. Uh, again, just great opportunity for, as a requirement for the Freedom Schools grants was not only the, the student component, but what we love about this grant is the community uh, involvement and the parent involvement. And um, we've been able to have some great success with these, this program. Um, we've seen some of the Freedom Schools um, programming at Granger. Uh, in fact, some of the pictures up here are one of the uh, field trips in, that they went on with parents as part of this just to uh, not only provide exposure from a cultural uh, lens in terms of some of the great uh, pieces that our city, city of Chicago has to offer, but uh, really making sure that these activities are engaging for our students, that some of our community leaders are involved in the um, instruction and in, in, in making sure that these students are already uh, having real-time mentors that they can start to connect with. Um, this next slide just shows uh, a flyer that was created by our, our Freedom Schools director, Dr. Johnson, and who has done a tremendous job uh, with this program. And again, um, in, in looking at all the things that they've been able to do, um, I would almost need to do a separate presentation, which I, I'm not advocating for at this point, but uh, it really, it, it, this is really just a snapshot of, of what's been taking place in, in our summer, during our summer. This next slide just shows some of those engagement totals. It's always good that when not only that when we're talking about programming, but we are uh, making sure that we are measuring it, that we are looking at enrollment numbers, that we're looking at participation. Uh, this metric just shows it based upon student engagement, and not only just from a student standpoint, but a, a parent standpoint as well. We'll continue to look at some of our uh, other uh, metrics um, that are not just about engagement, but to have this many students and parents involved over the summer is tremendous. And uh, we know this is, is really due to just uh, the administration um, that's been taking place at all of our schools. Great stuff. I, I, you know, it brings a smile to my face when I, I look back and, and think about how much we've been able to offer uh, these, these past couple of years to address the learning loss, but also in this final year of what we're going to be able to do. The challenge is going to be, we know that there are great things tied up in all these programs. And, and so what do we do? We know we have uh, budgetary um, priorities. We also know that um, there has to be a balance between what is offered and, and what we can continue to do as a district. Uh, with that, I'm more than um, happy to take any questions you may have. Um, and I think what we'll continue to do over this final year is work uh, closely with the the business office and, and also with our principals just to take a full look at what we're able to continue and, and if not, what what some alternatives might be. All right, thanks. Ms. Fosdick. Thank you for this presentation. I really um, am proud to see what administration collectively has been able to do with these funds for our students and families. Um, my favorite part still as a parent is the summer tote um, because there's also this subtle reminder that learning is a gift and we're sharing that with our students and our families. I also really appreciate that for students who don't qualify for other summer services, this is another thing to be able to do on the time that works for your family, whether or not you're home during the summer or you have other plans, this is something mm -hmm. that can still continue. Um, so I, I, you know, I'm confident that there will be a way to continue something along the lines that will continue to give students that kind of support over the summer um, if we can make it happen in any way. 
Thank you. Ms. Gantz. Thank you. I would like to read, uh, go along with uh, board member Fosdick's comments too with the summer totes. We had actually started getting them at Gombert before most other schools were through Title I funding. And I do remember all the kids in the school had this bag full of books and they're looking and they're like, that's all for me? Like, yeah, take it. They, and they were so excited. And it's great when you can see kids excited about, you know, learning, having fun, considering reading over the summer fun. So I, I do like that now that's been able to be expanded to all the students. And, I, you know, obviously, I agree. I hope that, you know, it is something we can continue with the summer learning. Um, and I know you did say one of the big priorities um, is the elementary class size reduction to keep working on that even when the funding's gone. Does any of the Title I funding cover that beyond, or is it just in terms of the kind of the special? Yeah, so the, the SR3 funds, we were, were able to make that a priority um, in working with the business office. Uh, they have already um, made this part of the future budget that will continue to uh, keep those class size reduction levels at, at their current level, if, if not lower. Okay, perfect. Uh, but we've already this office. Oh, excellent. No, that's wonderful. And I know that's what's on a lot of parents' minds, too, is that, and we all like the smaller class sizes. But, um, yeah, I did just want to thank you again for, you know, all of the administration, too, for all the work that you've put in. What these kids, what all of our kids get is such an amazing experience. And the fact that that now is, even during the summer, is something we can all be really proud of and work hard to continue. All right, Mr. Kourubis. Looking at slide five, the uh, funding runs through FY24, right? That's correct. So that runs through <clears throat> June of next year? That's correct. And uh, after that time, the federal government is not going to provide any more financial support for learning loss. That's correct. For after school programs, for summer programs. Um, so the federal government decided <coughs> to give us three years of funding through the states to, um, to address those issues. And then it decided to take away the funding, right? That's correct. And it left us to deal with any additional remaining learning loss, after school programs, and summer enrichment programs. So we um, are left to try to decide what are the priorities and how we want to use our funds, whether to continue supporting some or the other. But uh, three years was the grant and uh, nothing further. And so we are, the local taxpayers are largely responsible um, for continuing with the funding or not. Thanks. Ms. Dumming. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Lewis, for, for this, um, for the presentation. Um, as I look <coughs> at um, slide, I guess slide seven and slide maybe slide eight, um, as we talk about, you know, intuitively, you know, or, or at least we think that um, summer programs certainly help our students. Um, are we able to look and understand any analysis, um, you know, in a couple of years or next year, whatever, how, how can we, were we able to see um, from an analytic standpoint anything that helps us Garner what that impact was. Are we, and are we going to be able to see anything? Yeah, from I, this I, year? thank you for the question. Um, yes and no. I mean, when I say yes, I'm talking more about we we anticipate being able to, uh, especially with our iReady assessment, starting to take maybe a look not only at as a a hard comparison uh, post 
um, the pandemic of to see how students are growing, but also uh, to be able to identify just cohorts of students, maybe that have taken part in our summer programming, and then starting to take a look at how they are progressing um, with the iReady assessment. Because we're just brand new with that assessment, that was the, I hate to say no part, but we're not able to, to have hard numbers right now, but I think moving forward, um, just because of the timing with not only us where we're at uh, in recovery now, uh, post-pandemic, but also with the, um, uh, the adoption of that iReady assessment, I, I know that's gonna be a priority for the um, uh, Charles uh, and his assessment team, as well as all of our um, uh, cabinet and administration to start to take a look at some of those very things. You know, I the one of the one of the reasons for that question is, we in this district, um, the administrators and and our educational staff such does such an excellent job with um, applying for grants and seeing grants come in, and so any opportunities that we have in that end, and just information and data that we garner back, that we can use um, as we make assessments regarding budget and as we go forward, um, I would love to see us be able to have that information um, come through to us as we're looking at a variety of things as, as well as, um, again, the um, uh, academic staff having a chance to, to look at different grants that might show why this is so valuable. So. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Jane. Thank you, Dr. Lee, and congratulations on your first presentation. Um, Be the last. in this I position uh, I uh, really appreciated the pictures you chose for the slides I thought it just allowed us to get a feel for what maybe some of these students were feeling in these programs so whoever chose those pictures if that was you I, I really did appreciate that um, I'm, I think I'm gonna just echo what my fellow board members have stated I think two years ago during this time, there was just so much uncertainty with what the effects were going to be of the fan pandemic. And um, learning loss was such, was on all of our minds. And from the beginning, the administration, the district has been so thoughtful about how we were going to address it. And um, certainly, being an underfunded district, we don't take additional funding lightly. And particularly with these ESSER funds, what, in, in my view, you, you, everyone has been so very thoughtful about how we were allotting these funds. And mo many of the board members were always questioning, okay, how long can we have this even after these funds go? And as you mentioned with the reduction of class sizes, that was something on our minds, but as well as the, the coordinator positions, which we have seen um, throughout the years have such, such a positive impact on our students. And as member uh, Kruba stated, certainly there's still learning loss, um, and I do appreciate how you are explaining how you might be going about trying to find ways to preserve funding where we can for especially the programs that you've seen have been um, effective. Um, but as a community member, if I put that hat on, I think it's important for us to just see that how we are so mindful with whatever funds we get. And, um, and uh, you know, I, I, I know we will continue to do that with um, moving forward so I have no I have no questions I I I'm very happy to see what we've done with this fund these funds um, I I know we're gonna try our best to to sustain the programs that we can it is very sad to see that we can't continue all of them or expand them for that matter um, but I know I know that this uh, cabinet and members of the district are going to look to see ways that we can so thank you so much mr rising slide two uh, i have some comments here uh because this will be the last time i'm able to say this uh so 
again, this is very frustrating to me. Um, the amount of money. If you look at Rockford 205, they have a very, very similar size enrollment as we do. Um, they have a very, very similar size budget as we do. They received $7,800 per student. We received $497 per student. Now, mind you, the funding was largely based on a, a big factor was looking at low-income students. Mm -hmm. And in fairness, Rockford has 65% low-income students. We have about 16% low-income right. students. So I get that. However, if this was to address learning loss, in my opinion, learning loss doesn't look at income levels of students. Um, learning loss affects all students equally. Um, there's a level of frustration here that we received less than $500 per student. They received $7,800 per student. If you go to the next slide and you look at our comparisons here, the majority of these districts are better funded than we are in Indian Prairie. And yet all but one of them got more ESSER money than Indian Prairie did. Um, so there, again, is a frustration level for me because now take the low income level out of it, just look at how districts are funded. All these districts are better funded than us and yet we still receive less money. Um, I have a major issue with that. If you go to slide five, um, I share the common themes as the rest of my board members. I'm concerned about a lot of these things. Um, I think a lot of these things helped us as a district, not only helped us of learning loss of our students, the mental health coordinators, literacy and math coordinators, elementary class, class size reduction, these things have all had a major impact on our students and our staff and the learning of our students. Yes, the books are nice to have, you know, I, I love to continue that, but you know, I, I, I don't think it's something that's necessary, but all these other things here to me um, affect and impact the academics of our students. And dovetailing off of what Mr. Karuba said and what Ms. Deming said, it all comes down to data, right? So um, we're going to have to look at this data, whether it's the iReady data or whether it's the Illinois Assessment of Readiness data, the proficiency scores. Um, and we're going to have to go to our community and say, what, what do we prioritize here based on the academics and, and what gains have we seen and where do we want to put our money going forward. So um, this is something that we will probably be talking to the community again about um, because our community expects high outcomes of our students as does the board of our students and our staff. Um, and then lastly, um, I went back to look and, and I want to give thanks to administration um, because this board asked them frequently to give us updates on ESSER, on the CARES Act money, on you know the ESSER II funds, what we were doing consistently with this money. I went back and looked at all the board meetings where we discussed either CARES Act, ESSER II, ESSER III. We had a total of 12 meetings where we discussed this topic. Um, four times in 2021, with a big presentation in December of 2021, five times in 2022, with a big presentation of July 2022, and then three times in 2023, with this being a big presentation for 2023. 12 meetings, we've kept our community updated on what we've done with this money. We've been transparent. We've showed you all the programs that they went to. I think, and I give kudos to all the administration, the staff, that put the focus on our students with taking this money, this $13 million it received, $497 per student, and maximized it as much as we could. So thank you so much. So very well said by all board members. Um, it's hard to add something here, but I do wanna go back to slide three, two and three actually, but three. Um, I just wanna make clear that the calculation for this which irritates us to no end, um, was not something that was in our control. Like uh, the profile of our district led to this number. It was a formula that the state put together. 
So um, our district is astute at going after grant money and making sure that we apply the things that we think um, we can receive to help support our students. And if there was any way we could have gotten more, we would have done it. But it's like our profile of what we have in our district just led to this number. And honestly, when I look at this, I mean, I'm grateful for the 13 million plus that we received. And all of these programs that we put together were a phenomenal um, help for our students. Um, I can't imagine what you would do with $6,000 per student. And how, I mean, they had three years to spend that too, right? So it's like, yeah. how in the world could they even come up with programs that would consume that amount of money? I mean, um, you look at the list of things that we put together for our measly $497 per student, and it is impressive. And, um, you know, I, I wish that we would have this ongoing support, but th some of these programs are critical, and we have to find ways to, to keep them in, the, in our um, programming. And I do think, agreeing with Mr. Rising's comments, um, that we've been incredibly, and also others that mentioned this, very thoughtful and um, deliberate in choosing how we spent this money, and extremely transparent. So in the news, you frequently see these stories about people getting a bunch of money from the federal government and that it you know disappears somewhere it's like we have told people endlessly what we're doing with it what programming we're using this for and um i don't think that you can ask more from what we've done with this money so um, thank you for everything and for our administration for all of the programming you put together to support this so thanks thank you all right, our next topic is, let's see, where am I? We'll have a presentation from Matt Shipley and Ron Wilkie on safety and security. I never, I don't know why I'm the one trying to figure out how to use the microphone, right? Right. Uh, good evening, members of the Board of Education. Uh, we are excited tonight to present you a safety, security, and emergency preparedness update. Uh, this presentation is consistent with Board Policy 4.170 uh, and Strategic Plan Priorities 2 and 4. Uh, I do want to briefly mention, I think this is the first time, at least in recent history, that we've been asked to uh, discuss with the Board our safety, security, and emergency preparedness. But this is a topic that definitely overlaps with a lot of um, discussions and, and conversations we have on, on a daily basis as administration and also with presentations that you see at the board. So we'll overlap with some things that have been brought up um, in our annual facility presentations uh, that have been brought up during some technology updates. Um, when we talk about um, training and personnel, you know, that'll overlap with our human resources annual updates as, as well as even our social emotional initiatives and some of the uh, mental health work that really um, a core part of that's making sure our students feel safe and secure in their school environment. So uh, while this is the first time we've had a, a time exclusively dedicated to this topic, we, we do believe a lot of this will, will overlap with, with previous discussions. Um, with me tonight is Ron Wilkie, our Safety, Security, and Emergency Preparedness Coordinator. Uh, Ron has been with the district for about 18 months now after a long career in law enforcement. Uh, we've been fortunate as a district. We were one of the first districts to recognize the need to really have a full-time safety and security coordinator position. And we've been fortunate to, to fill that position um, w with individuals who have a long background in law enforcement and also a passion for school and community safety. And so Ron has continued that tradition in the, in the past 18 months. Uh, before we get too far in the presentation, I do just want to emphasize that the safety and security of all members of our school communities is the district's number one priority. And I want to be clear, this isn't my priority or Ron's priority or, or our administrative team at the district's priority. This really is lived every day in our school buildings. Um, you know, I can't talk about the number of times we're in a, or at a school building or talking with an administrator and safety and security comes up as, as one of the first things they want to talk about, whether it's a, 
um, a quick conversation about lunchroom setup and lunchroom tables or, or a, a bigger discussion about, a, again, about a curriculum or, or our educational philosophy. I mean, we, we do see this coming up um, over and over again in talking with our, our team leaders at the building level. And really that makes our job, my, my job and Ron's job, um, a lot easier because we really are in a support position to support our, our people who are in our buildings every day and be a resource for them. Um, so I do just want to speak to that, that strong safety and security culture that we have throughout the district. Um, with that said, tonight's um, agenda will start with a school safety overview, just a broad overview of some of the uh, policies and procedures we have in place. Uh, Ron will then talk about some of the emergence, um, emerging school safety issues kind of at a national and state level, um, what we've sort of learned from some of the, those incidents that have occurred over the last year and how we've um, addressed our policies to make sure that we would be prepared if a similar incident happened at Indian Prairie. Um, we will talk um, briefly about two incidents that happened at Indian Prairie this year, uh, kind of a year in review and our response to those. And again, what we've, um, what we've learned as part of the debrief process and, and how we've continued to improve our processes. Um, we'll give an update on the security assessment that's tied to our overall master facility plan, which uh, again, we'll be presenting in full to the board in November. And then finally, we do want to end tonight just talking a little bit about community collaboration and how we will be making, um, continue to make an effort uh, to work with our community, recognizing that safety and security really involves everyone to ensure that we have a safe and secure school community. Um, before we get um, any further, I do just want to emphasize that we do have some confidentiality kind of ingrained in our um, safety and security plans. Um, really, that's to ensure the, the, that uh, the plans work as intended uh, to and again, to ultimately ensure that we're protecting all members of our school community. So while we'll talk in, um, again, I'll talk a lot tonight about a lot of our procedures that are in place, there may be some details that we uh, have to leave out or, or just have to be a little broad about to ensure that we're, we're keeping some key parts um, um, confidential. All right, thank you and, and for, uh, I appreciate this opportunity. You can see up on the screen some of our current safety procedures. This is not a all-encompassing list for sure, but I did want to point out three of them that are highlighted in red there that emerged this last school year. Um, two of them I will um, go into a little bit later with the light speed alerts and the dismissal and arrival um, updates that we did. The last one on the bottom there is Do Smart, which is a new program that's an acronym for DuPage School Mutual Aid Response Team. And that is something that the School Safety Task Force with DuPage ROE has put together. So we worked on that all last year. Um, we have a meeting tomorrow with the advisory committee, and I hope after that that it is put into place for this year. What this really is is following a model that law enforcement and fire departments utilize to utilize resources from surrounding neighborhoods when they realize that a district, in this case, has a critical emergency that expands the resources staff or any other um, output that they could have to contain or, or um, solve that emergency. So what we're looking to do is have all the districts in DuPage County work together, train together on, on the same set of rules so that if we did need to call District Tool 3 or Elmhurst or Wheaton or somewhere like that, um, they could send trained staff to help us out for possibly a reunification or mental health crisis or, or some other um, large unfolding critical incident and we could do the same for them. So, yeah. am I on? Need more? Hello. Thank you. <laughs> We're all over the place I, I tonight. With normally, the mic, so. not ever uh, told that the people can't hear me, so I was trying not to uh, blow you out of the. All right. So that uh, is a listing that, that I will refer to those top two highlighted ones as, as we move into this. As Matt mentioned, we're going to talk a little bit on a national scale as we go through this and, and talk about some issues that severely impacted our school safety and kind of our security operations as we went through this. The first one is the host calls and, and swatting. And, and I'll um, refresh a little bit of that for anybody that is not aware what the swatting is. Essentially, it is a fictitious call called in by someone um, many times overseas that um, calls a police department and says that they have just witnessed an active shooter at, in most cases, a school, and they are requesting a large police presence. What they're looking for is a police presence, obviously, to show up with the school unknown that this is happening, create trauma and fear when that happens among the students and staff, and it has kind of a, a longer effect on that. So 
What we recognized last summer, um, the bomb hoax calls were coming into a lot of colleges around the United States. Um, so we had an eye on that and wondered if that was going to repeat because we had one of those um, last May at one of our high schools. When school started in August and September, a few states started reporting multiple on, on a specific day and kind of regionally multiple of these swatting calls. So in September, we started talking about it as a staff saying we, we acknowledge that this is happening throughout the country. We assume as the Chicago metropolitan area that we are kind of a, a prime area for this to occur to us. Um, so we began doing multiple trainings, tabletop discussions. Um, we actually met with our dispatchers and police department and fire and came up with a plan that we thought we would use um, to minimize this. Um, based on clues that we were getting from the FBI and other um, entities about what was going on with this. So we were fortunate enough to not have this happen to us. Um, Illinois did experience it with um, a high school in Wheaton in February, so it went about five months. All throughout that time, we were talking with our schools, our district staff about what our plan was in place. We needed to be prepared. This was probably going to occur, maybe not in District 204, but somewhere in our area. Um, so. I will, I'm kind of foreshadowing for later on, but that's uh, the first thing that came up last school year that we were really keeping an eye on, knowing how traumatic that could be if one of our large high schools had that happen to it or, or a middle school. Of course, last July 4th, Highland Park had their tragedy, and, and um, as timing would have it, we actually had our annual review that the School Safety Drill Act mandates a couple weeks after that. So we were already prepared to meet with our first responders and our partners with that to discuss things. This, of course, was a big topic in it. And we shifted our focus to special events, off-campus events such as field trips and sporting events and parades. Obviously, that happening during the July 4th parade. So we started really working on things that we could enhance when we looked at our, our um, plans and we needed a little bit more medical training. So we ha had that with our marching bands. We did more of that just um, over last summer and then just a couple weeks ago with more uh, training. We upped our crisis communication plan. So we issued more radios to be taken to these events. We issued um, more of a thorough crisis plan of rally points, local hospitals, what to do in, in certain situations. Um, and then we recognized that we needed to even push that a little bit more. So you see on the, the bullet point special event um, security seminar, we contracted with DuPage Office of Homeland Security and Office of Emergency Management and their um, former director who was in FEMA came out and provided instruction to our staff about three weeks ago so that we could be prepared for special events going into the new year. Um, and Lightspeed um, Human Alert, we utilize that as well. Uh, mostly in this case, and I will get into that a little bit more, but this one in harm to others. So we are monitoring district um, technical or tech devices to make sure that nobody is doing searches that, that might lead to um, some kind of uh, harm to our staff and students. The last one was the Ohio train derailment in East Palestine, um, Ohio, which occurred in February. And if you're, you remember this one, um, almost uh, 100,000 or a little bit more than 100,000 um, gallons of hazardous material was spilled. And why it's important to us is it severely impacted the school district. They have um, had to not have school for over a week, but the lasting impacts for people who didn't want to bring their students to, to school, whether it was safe, to the extracurricular and after school, um, it really um, impacted their continuity of operations following that. So as timing would have it, you see on that, um, the screen there, the map there, which is a, uh, the Burlington Northern Line that goes through Aurora and Naperville and is very close to some of our schools. Um, we went to a um, Office of Emergency Management school preparedness workshop about three weeks prior to that. And that was a picture that was on the um, FEMA director's screen saying, are we all aware that that we have a lot of hazardous materials that go through our area from Chicago to the rest <laughs> of the United States and they happen to pass close by um, some of our areas. So with that in mind and with East Palestine coming, we knew that we needed to 
have some safety bulletins and plans in place for our schools that we're in part and really start honing in on the exercises that we do to make sure we have all our plans in place. So we did the safety bulletin a few weeks after the East Palatine incident. We met with all of our local first responders, emergency management agencies, fire department, hazmat teams, police, and said what would we do if this happened in our neighborhood and how would we handle that? So we did a tabletop exercise, which is kind of an informal way of everybody explaining their roles and what resources we have. Um, each place from fire to emergency management talks about how they would handle it and how we would work together to have that unified command. And then you saw probably after that, there were several others because it was highlight and heightened attention to it. Another in Ohio, um, several others. So we did an incident management team at a district level, another tabletop to say, as a district management, how would we handle this, and then tied that into our other tabletops. So now bringing it more to a local level and to the incident that occurred at Granger Middle School, um, just as a, a summary for what occurred on that February morning, we had a 20-year-old male subject um, attempt to gain entry to our school, in fact, did gain entry as he was walking in, blended in with some of our students, um, and it was a very critical incident, but for the acts of our staff would have been a much worse incident, we believe. But um, I, what was abundantly clear to me and everyone else who was either on scene that day or took part in the debrief was that our staff acted phenomenally. Um, they used the training that was given in school safety drill acts and, and the reunification training and every other training that we provided to them to not only confront this person, they recognized that they shouldn't be in the school, um, they contained them until the police were there when he did not uh, um, kind of obey any commands or wasn't making a lot of sense with what he was doing, gave fictitious answers of why he was there. Um, and then to do a reunification and continue the continuity of education by almost 400 students were released to their parents and we still kept the school day going. And then of course to have the well-being of the staff and, and all the students at top of mind while we did these debriefs. So. That being said, after every critical incident, we do an after action review because we know that there's always things that we can do better and we can continually improve on that. So when we do an after action review, we normally highlight three things. We say, what did we do well in this? What are some things that we can improve on? And what are the things we're gonna do to make those improvements? So we first started with this. The school did their own after action review. We did a district level when, with the school officials there as well to provide the input from what they got. Um, with this, we came up with some, some gaps that we identified that we thought we could address. So there's a couple of those that I, I won't discuss now, but the silver lining is that is we pushed those out to all the schools in the district and asked that all of them would comply with these new things that we learned from the Granger incident. But one of them that came out of it was that we knew that there was a crucial gap for arrival and dismissal of about 15 to 20 minutes where we wanted our staff to pay attention to the students and staff coming to school, not be burdened by parents coming in and wanting impromptu conferences, not by appointments, things like that. So Dr. Talley, shortly after this, put out a, um, a directive to our, our staff and our students and our school community about giving that 15 to 20 minute break before school starts so we can fully concentrate on that. So that our school principals aren't talking to people out front, they're keeping an eye on who's coming up so we can confront people before they might get into our school. Um, and I alluded to earlier the swatting part, we thought we made it through the whole school year without getting this, but then in April, um, nine schools in Illinois were targeted um, the, the time before. It seemed they did a um, alphabetical because they were all ZW and, and Y schools and now this time it was kind of A schools. So um, Waubonsie Valley was the target for it. Um, I'm happy to say that, that we had minimal disruption of that because we had literally been training for it for six months or more about what we were gonna do. And it honestly worked to a T. Our SRO heard, it, heard the call come in, immediately called his um, partners with Aurora PD recognized that the information including teacher name, room number, um, what could happen because it just so happened that it was a good day and there weren't as many students there for this. Um, they were all false, so they knew that this was a false alarm. They utilized all the staff exactly how we were talked about and I, I think you're all aware probably the limited disruption we didn't have um, students off of school or parents um, 
super upset because of this, because of the way that it was handled. So um, again, kind of that effective collaboration between us and, and our police departments. You saw from that earlier picture, um, that was the special response team from Wabonzi Valley, and they were, they were in Wabonzi Valley this summer working on that specific tactic of what would we do and how would we slow down and make sure we used the shield and made sure that, that we didn't impact the students as much as possible. In these swatting incidents, they're hoping the police will barge in and, and kind of go through and make a lot of noise and, and do maybe a, a more typical police response, and we learned that that's not what we wanted to do. And finally, light speed notifications. So we've had these notifications that, that point out information that comes from our, um, our District 204 owned devices and searches that are happening on them, but we haven't had a human review which was rolled out by the Lightspeed Corporation this past school year. What that means is that trained specialists, typically from law enforcement or education, are actually checking out flagged um, uh, of these searches or posts. And we only had it for two. We had it for self-harm and harm to others. The overwhelming majority of all of ours were self-harm. Um, again, the overwhelming majority were something related to um, reading Shakespeare and it said something about suicide or dying or others. But there were some that were definitely things that we needed to address and look into and provide mental health crisis for um, and attention to these students. So we did get those. Um, we got a lot more that weren't legitimate, but we did check in with them anyway with school staff. So how this works is if there's a threat deemed to be imminent, they will immediately call the school principals, myself, and a number of others so that we um, can get police involved or fire. This happened a couple times Friday night at 10 o'clock and somebody posted something. So we, we were, had the ability to provide resources at that time. And then a high alert is something that mentions um, as, I, as I said, maybe a, a quote that could be attributed to a school project, and we check on that anyway, and that is why they have the human review. If 20 of those come in, they see clearly this was a classroom assignment. If one of them comes in, then they alert us through an email that we might need to check that out. That goes directly to the principal, the assistant principal, myself, um, and a couple other people within the district staff to make sure that we're checking on those as well. And any time that we come to um, one of those, as the last bullet mentions, the students are um, spoken to, and if they need any mental health or, or um, crisis uh, you know, uh, help at that point, then we provide that. All right. So we've mentioned our master facility plan probably at, at almost every meeting here, uh, but just wanted to take a chance to again talk about it and talk uh, sort of exclusively about the, the safety and security assessment um, piece of that. Uh, we're working with the architectural firm of White & Company as well as the firm Answer Advisory to do this work. And so the, the next two slides are kind of directly from Answer Advisory as, as they um, presented to us their, their work plan. And so just wanted to, to spend a few minutes walking through it. Um, one of the things we really liked about their approach to it was this, this concept of layers of protection. So even though we said we were doing this as part of a master facility plan, um, the different layers or the different um, items that they're going to look at through that process or have looked at through that process um, really go on to encompass a variety of, of, of pieces, right? So it's not just the um, school site and the building design that maybe is, it would be a core facility assessment piece but it's also the physical security equipment, the technology, um, our school personnel, the, the training, the exercises, and the drills we do, as well as a full policy and procedure review as well. So we really felt that this was a comprehensive approach to look at safety and security. And I think what's, what's appealing for us is we start to work through um, sort of the back half of this process and we start looking at recommendations and, wh and what we can do to um, continually improve our, our safety and security um, throughout the district is that all these different layers have different um, mechanisms to improve, different, um, you know, di potentially different timelines to implement. So whereas maybe a um, significant physical security improvement may take us several years to, to properly fund and design and, and build, some of the security policies and procedures piece we'll be able to implement on a, on a quicker time scale. Um, again, I think we've the initial feedback is that we're generally pretty strong in, in some of those areas. Um, 
uh, we've talked a lot tonight about our reliance on training exercises and drills and um, the initial feedback's been that we're very uh, that we're very good in that area but again those are some areas that we can continually um, roll out to our staff to our buildings on a fairly quick timeline as maybe we have a longer term goal to work towards some of the physics physical security needs The second piece, just to walk through what their, their process has been so far. So it has included an on-site security assessment of all um, Indian Prairie properties. Uh, these assessments have been completed. They were completed during the spring 2023 uh, period. Um, so our team and their team is currently processing that those um, recommendations and then are going to incorporate that into that master facility plan. Um, just to talk through what that um, assessment process included, um, in addition to the, a full walkthrough of the building and, and looking again at the, the actual site and the physical infrastructure, um, it included interviews with our principal and, and other members of the leadership team, um, building operations staffs, so our, our Airmark custodians and our maintenance teams, as well as district-wide le leadership as well. Um, looked at a review of um, documented security concerns and historical incident data. So they really looked at this being a holistic approach, seeing the school not just as, as you know, one building, but as a, as a community within a larger community of Naperville and Aurora, right? So recognizing that what may be right for our community and the recommendations that are ultimately going to come out of this are going to be different than it they would be if it was a similar building in a rural setting or in a, a more urban, you know, city of Chicago sort of setting. Um, again, did, the, did a full campus walkthrough. Um, that included a lot of video, um, a lot of uh, images. Uh, it, 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 at many of our facilities, they, they took drone footage, and we were able to watch um, arrival and dismissal with the, you know, from a couple thousand feet up, which was uh, really exciting, and I think had some good insights into um, traffic patterns and things like that. So uh, again, a co comprehensive walkthrough is, is part of this process as well. And then ultimately the goal is, is to use what they refer to as their security and resiliency score, or R-Shield, um, to really identify where we are at and what we can do to really drive and improve, drive improvement. So trying to take a lot of data and, and really boil it down to, to a single score or number with then um, a, a few key uh, mitigating items that can help improve that score. Um, and again, as part of their process, they're providing full recommendations and cost estimates that, that can help improve that R Shield score. Um, I do want to mention we, we are incorporating this into our master facility plan that will be presented to the board in November. However, we're not waiting until November to start working on some of these recommendations. Um, so we're, uh, next month, we're presenting our summer of 2024 capital uh, plans, and we will already have some of these um, recommendations built into that work. Um, again, as well as seeing the opportunities on some of those operational items, policy items that we can kind of improve in real time. Um, I do want to talk this, this specific item that, uh, again, a little foreshadowing for next month, but um, we do, um, as part of this, we've, we've seen the need to, to really be able to improve our, our doors. Uh, and, and again, doors not just... Um, you know, thinking of the door itself, but the, the access point. And so it's, again, thinking of this layered approach or, or thinking of it comprehensively, how do we incorporate some new technology into the door so that instead of using a traditional lock and key, we can use electronic system that then, then again, ties into some of our um, personnel management so that we can, um, you know, go to more of a key entry system, monitor when people are entering and exiting, be able to potentially um, narrow the windows that different individuals are allowed access. So that, for example, if you have a coach who needs access to a specific location at four in the morning because he's the, the swim coach and um, you know we know how crazy our swimmers are getting there early in the morning, um, instead of having to give him a, a key that's going to work 24-7, we can give him an electronic ac ac um, access that'll work from four to 4.15 or, you know, um, similarly in the evening. So just looking at, at really being able to, to again, take that, that comprehensive approach, the, the, the sort of different areas that, that we can address um, and provide a solution that, that, again, maybe we wouldn't have found if we were just looking at the physical um, plant and, and physical security piece. Um, so finally, this, this evening, just wanted to, to close by talking about um, our work towards community collaboration. And we do want to emphasize, um, I, I think, 
you know, in our role, we tend to take a lot on ourselves. Again, we mentioned how critical uh, everybody in our schools believes that the safety and security of our, our students are. But um, we do need some help from our community to ensure that we have safe and secure schools. Um, it's just, just want to talk through a, a few items that um, in our mind are, are pretty straightforward and, and we hope our community can, can assist um, us in, in, again, ensuring safe and secure environments. So the first is, is this concept of if you see something, say something. Um, one of the, the, the things that did come out of the after action reports with the Granger incident that was a, a little discouraging and we need to work with is, is we did hear from a few students and, and even parents you know, that they did see an individual who wasn't acting like a member of the school community, um, that was uh, approaching students and, and uh, um, outside, and, and again, did, nobody recognized them as a member of our school community, but that wasn't reported until to administration until after the individuals inside our building. So when we talk about an incident that, again, was a, a significant incident for that school community, um, there was a potential for that to to really have been resolved outside the school facility if, if individuals had said something. And um, you know, when, when I hear that you know, they, they weren't acting like a middle school student, I mean, that does take a lot of work to not act like a middle school student, right? So the fact that we were able to identify that and, and not report it, um, again, just speaks to that need to continue to reiterate that message. So um, again, asking, asking this evening, and, and we'll continue to reiterate that message that um, uh, communication is critical, and if you do see something, um, please say something to either our administration or, um, again, if it's if if it's local police or or other groups, that that is critical to protect our community. Um, again, we do ask that families um, review our district and school communications. We'll ha I know we tend to have uh, a lot of communication come out, especially this time of year before we start the school year. But we have a lot of critical safety information in there. Um, as Ron mentioned earlier, we are asking our community to, to be a little bit mindful of when they visit our schools, for example. So we just want to make sure that our families are, are staying up to date and, and um, when we do make changes to our procedures that, that they're aware of that. Um, again, our communities um, do have um, notification systems, you know, Naper Notify and, and Aurora similarly have, have systems where you can sign up to get general community information as well. And we do encourage all members of our community to, to enroll or, or in those subscriptions as well. Um, the, last, the, the last two points, you know, we, we did as part of our security assessment really identify that the amount of unscheduled drop-offs and unscheduled visits we see at our schools, um, particularly at our elementary schools, um, really has become a hindrance towards maintaining a, a secure school facility. So. Um, well, we want to encourage um, um, parents to be involved in our school community as, as volunteers. Um, we do want to work towards having that be more scheduled and, and um, again, just, just more, um, more in a way that can be predicted by our schools. Um, you know, we've, we've heard a lot about that, that front entrance really being a vulnerable point for us just with the amount of um, parent drop-offs, deliveries, um, you know, forgotten lunches, again, parents looking for some impromptu meetings with, with the principal or administration. So um, that, that is an area that we'll be looking to, to communicate around and, and improve this school year. Um, and, and similarly, we know um, we have um, a significant vulnerability at arrival and dismissal, and a lot of that's tied to just the amount of traffic and volume we have in our neighborhoods. Uh, we know most of our schools were built as neighborhood schools with the intention that students would walk to school and we'd have limited bus or, or car traffic outside our schools. Um, so now that we, we're in an environment where we do see more traffic, where we do see more parent drop-offs and pickups, um, you know that, that creates challenges. Right? We just don't have the infrastructure to deal with that and, and to really handle all that traffic in a, in a safe manner. Um, so again, just asking our, our community to be mindful of that um, as they're driving around our schools near those arrival and dismissal times. Um, you know, we, we believe these asks are, are reasonable and also tie directly to our portrait of a graduate. Um, and really tie, tie most critically to that citizenship concept, right? We, we recognize that, again, maintaining safe schools, um, schools that um, provide a, an ideal learning environment for all our students requires all of us to, to chip in and make that possible. Um, so we really want to tie to that, that citizenship concept. Um, although, you know, I'll point out we do see some, um, some ties to communication, to, to adaptability and flexibility as well. So um, just... To, just tying this, this ask really to, to that portrait of a graduate. Um, 
And again, as mentioned, we will be working on increasing our safety and security communication, um, both through district and school channels this fall. Um, we have a great opportunity with School Safety Week and I believe early October to do a lot of that, as well as through our back to school. Um, so just to conclude this evening, um, we um, will continue to support safe and secure school communities. Um, again, I just mentioned um, we will have continual communication. Uh, again, welcome back videos, and then we will also be offering a virtual parent university this fall, uh, with safety and security being the topic. Um, similar to what we documented tonight, we will um, continually to review our national, state, and local trends. We'll continue to do full debriefs and after action reviews of any incidents that occurred in Indian Prairie. And then finally, we do, uh, as mentioned, we do look forward both in September and November to um, talk through our full security assessment and how we um, have used that to develop recommendations for our master facility plan. And so with that, we are both available for any questions from the board. All right, Mr. Rising, we'll start with you. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, thank you, um, Matt, for starting out and kind of discussing how we are kind of giving an overview because I've often told parents that we can't discuss in detail what a lot of our emergency procedures are and plans are um, because we don't want that getting out in the public for obvious reasons because bad people look to find you know, out information. So thank you for, for mentioning that. Um, one of the questions I do have is is there a way we can get better? Uh, let me preface why I'm asking this question. Um, obviously, it, it goes without surprise that, that parents are, have a heightened awareness of security issues within our schools um, from what they're seeing on the media. Um, but obviously, everybody wants to be vigilant, vigilant and, and on high alert, and we all should be all the time. Um, but do you think we could do a better job of defining certain things? Because I, I feel like when we send communications out, and I don't want to step on our communication director's toes too much, but um, I feel like sometimes there's a misunderstanding of what a lock in place is versus a lock down. And, and people hear lock in place and they're freaking out when it's just probably an internal issue with a kid who's having a mental health crisis, but everybody thinks there's an intruder in the area, and there's, I think some, we need to def better define what those things are for our community. Did you, can I just respond to that quick? And, and I'll respond to that, and thank you, like, setting that one up for us, because um, Lisa Barry and I and uh, Jeannie Dinah have been working on that. That's going to be a new addition to our website this year, as well as the welcome back videos with some helpful information and the parent university. So we're going to talk about things like the reunification process and what we require of parents when we do that. We know we had two reunifications, both school-led this past um, semester. So we know that that is going to occur and probably will in the future. We did a good job at both of them, um, but we need the parents to understand that as well. As far as our classroom action guide, kind of what you're referring to, we have an Alice response, which is what happened at Granger in that instant. We also have a hold in place and teach for something occurring inside the school and a secure the building and teach for something occurring outside. Both of those are not necessarily complete emergency situations. They are just trying to err on the side of caution. So I completely agree with what you're saying and we can get that information out. So when we do send home a secure the building and teach, it was probably because one of our local police departments had something going on four blocks away or there was a dangerous animal running around that we just didn't want people to go out. But and you understand, huge, but you understand the parents' concern because yeah. there needs to be a rubric for parents so they can say, because we are sometimes and we have to be sometimes very vague in the way we communicate. And the principals usually communicate, or the district does, but most oftentimes the principal will communicate to their parents' community. But for reasons of, I'm assuming, and this is what I tell parents, investigation that's currently taking place, we have to sometimes be very vague. And if there's no rubrics for parents where they can go, oh, lock in place, oh, that's just something that's happened internally. Okay, whew, I can relax now because what happens is social media. And what happens is a freak out among the community 
And if it's in an area that I'm in and, or a board member's in, we get about 50 different calls saying what's going on. And we can, we, oftentimes, Dr. Talley will let us know, but we can only, we can't say too much either if there's something going on. So again, that rubric would be wonderful. And then I will also add on to that is that when the communication goes out, it would be nice to be able to say like, and I know we often do this, but even being clear would be great. Like everything is okay. We will share more details with you when the time is appropriate, but understand this is also an investigation. This involves minors. And therefore, see, parents want to know everything. And sometimes we can't tell them everything because it is an issue that involves a minor and we can't share that information. So again, I think just better understanding for the community about that would be incredible. Um, so thank you. And then the last thing, um, I also, I believe this, if you see something, say something. In my tenure as a parent in this district, that has been so invaluable. Like, I think 90% of what happens, we usually hear from other parents or other students. And I think we just need to keep pounding that as much as crazy because that's where we're going to hear something. Because a kid's going to see something on social media or a parent's going to see it. And they can't be afraid like, oh, I don't want to bother the district. No, I'm sure the principals and you, Ron, would rather know than not know. Well, thanks, and, and we have many avenues for that, from our tip line, anonymous tip line, to just contacting anybody, and I would go, and I always do when we talk about that, is I go one step farther. You see something, say something, or do something, okay? And in this case, that, that Matt re referenced, just maybe telling a staff member that something needed to be addressed outside might have been changed that whole perspective. And then to circle back at your, your first point, um, we actually have a what we call a classroom action guide that has some specific like um, if you're holding place and teach it's normally there's a medical emergency within the building or there's a student that is having some difficulty and we just want to give them some space so we can put that out as well there's nothing proprietary or that would impact us and maybe it needs um, to get out to the PTAs and stuff like that too so they can spread it as well sure. you know we could oh. certainly put that out okay. thanks Ms. Dumming Thank you both, Matt and Ron. Um, excellent presentation. I so appreciate, Ron, you having an opportunity to um, just review. I, I think, you know, the transparency of us talking about situations that occur in our district, it is, um, it, it can be difficult, but so important for uh, us to share because, as we well know, different, uh, once, once word starts spreading, sometimes things um, aren't as accurate so I truly appreciate us addressing those situations and sharing that and um, Matt I I get so excited it's it's almost exciting when I look at the growth when we've talked about our master um, facilities plan in in over the past couple years what we've had to you know what we've talked about and in, in, in the focus but I so appreciate you and your team and administration finding an organization um, it is answer um, yep. that looks comprehensively, not just at making sure, uh, understanding, you know, how safe our facilities are from the construction standpoint, but looking at the entire security. Because I know you talked a lot about our community from a school community standpoint, but our schools are in neighborhoods, so. Things that impact our schools impact the community, those neighborhoods. So it's not just the school community. And that's why it's so important for us to be able to understand what's going on and taking a look comprehensively at this. I will be so um, looking forward to hearing and seeing the, what you have to share with us as we go forward. But I think this is critical, truly important for us to begin to look at how we can a facility standpoint make sure that our schools um, are safe because it impacts our students our staff our community is wide so thank you great yeah no we're we're, we're excited too so All right, miss Jane thank you for this very informative presentation um, I also appreciated Ron you walking us through 
um, some of the most more recent incidents and just it just gives us a a better appreciation of what all is involved when we talk about security so that was that was very informative thank you um, back to member uh, crew, uh, rising's comment about um, being more clear in our communication are we also do we have it written in different languages to ensure our parents um, who where English is not their main language would be able to understand that's something we're thinking about. Bring that up with our, okay. our communications director. Great. Um, we do have a new um, language line that we put into play um, just for this year. Uh, in my previous position, we used it for almost two decades, so I'm very excited for that, for just interpretation and um, the ability to get on site for any language that we could, we know we have a lot of language and dialect spoken in, in District 204, and this will be, I, I really think, a little bit of a game changer when talking with parents, and maybe that had some difficulties with communications before or over the phone. Um, so yeah. that will be a great uh, plus for our district this year, too. Yeah, wonderful, especially with security. You know, it's just another barrier that we want to remove. Um, and to slide 10 with, let me get to that slide here. Regarding light speed, I also appreciated uh, your explanation on, on how that works. I, I remember asking Dr. Talley some specific questions about this. I was just curious, um, when we do go out and offer assistance, um, and, and I, I probably should have asked this earlier in an email, but and you don't have to answer this now, but how was, what was the reaction like to those who received assistance? Um, was that welcomed, or how, what's the process like? Um, well, th there's two different timing that we get. One's called imminent, and one is called um, high risk. And so the high risk, in their estimation, is the you should do something about this within a 24-hour period. That's generally their recommendation. We, of course, don't wait on that, but if we get an email at 2 in the morning that some student was on there, it probably is not getting addressed until that next morning. But we had, um, I, I looked at it, I, I believe, about 20 throughout the year that um, were phone calls that we received, which meant that they felt from the human review angle that this was imminent. Um, every single one of them was self-harm related, not harm to the schools, so we didn't have to go down that way of, of stopping some act of violence on our schools. Um, many of them were in off-school hours and, and necessitated the principal either to call me, we conferred, most of the time we contacted the local police who did a check well-being on the house um, and met with the parents and the student. Right. Many of those did, um, did you know, seek help and, and seek guidance, um, and we were kind of in the better safe than sorry camp, yes. and some explained it in a way that we were comfortable with, but we are, are, are without getting too much into it, sure. we know that some of the things that we maybe wouldn't have seen had we not had light speed um, and not been able to address, uh, but I did not hear of any negative reactions that we received on it. Some, yes, are false positives, Sometimes you ask a student and they say, yeah, I was reading Othello or something and I was <laughs> writing about that and we get it, okay. Yeah. Um, but we wanna make sure, right? Sure. Um, and then other times they did legitimately say, yes, they could use to talk with somebody and then our school social workers or psychologists were involved with that as well. Wonderful, thank you so much. Mr. Kurubis. Uh Page four. I love seeing kind of the coordination that we're doing with, um, you know, the local law enforcement and the fire departments and the emergency response uh, personnel. Um, you can kind of see some of the tension in what we're doing and what is in here with restricting access after the school starts and having parent volunteer security assistance you know, they might be manning the front desk or they might be, um, you know, volunteering in the classroom. And so there's, there's tension there with trying to uh, keep it secure. Um, 
but then allow the parents to come in and help. Um, so I, I, I kind of appreciate the tension there. Uh, the, you know, you, it's mentioned the, the safety drills we, we do here, and it, that in and of itself is rather extensive with having to do, you know, three fire drills, a tornado drill, a bus evacuation, and uh, a school shooter drill. Um, so we have, uh, you know, a limited number of school days, and we're still doing all these drills um, during school time to try to um, educate student staff and and our uh, local departments on, on kind of how to how to respond appropriately. And then it even expands further from beyond these things to, you know, uh, our ability to just close schools completely for severe emergencies and safety issues. Um, and then s small things that you see where, you know, the fire alarms on the walls and the uh, defibrillators and uh, when we test for lead. So there's all these things that are involved in safety to make sure that students and staff um, can go to school in a safe environment that, um, you know, it, it's not just a plan, it's not just implementing, but we've got to have the resources there, we've got to have the, the tools. Um, so I, this is like a small sn snippet of what we're doing, and you can keep adding to it and drilling down to see um, the extra stuff that is in um, the district's plans, the school's plans. Um, so that's just a, a comment. Um, on page seven, I'd like to kind of delve a little bit further into the uh, the train derailment. You know, we've got kind of major train tracks in our school district, north, south, east, west, right through, smack through the middle. Um, and, and Naperville has a history of a major train accident. Um, 1946, 45 people were killed when the passenger train was stopped and the other one didn't slow down at all. Um, and even, so it wasn't a major spill, it wasn't toxic that slowed down, um, but it impacted the community greatly, um, and something like that could happen again. Um, so we've, we're moving a lot of metal st stuff through our district at high speeds. Mm -hmm. um, I'm surprised that we've been this safe that long, so kind of kudos to what's being done to, to keep it that way. Um, but that is definitely a, a risk. So I'm glad to see that we are trying to be part of planning for a solution that hopefully we never have to deal with. Um, and that's it. Besides looking forward to the uh, facilities assessment report, I, um, I've probably been the longest beat around the table and it started with the deferred maintenance um, and it has grown immensely to include a lot of other things as appropriately it, it should have. So thank you for your work. And Ron, we can discuss this later at the next uh, meeting at the airport we have. Ms. Fosdick. Ms. Fosdick. Thank you for all of this information. As a parent, this is incredibly reassuring. Um, and I will remind people to come and search for this presentation when they have questions for you know what, well, what are we doing in the district because when I walked by this school this is what I saw um, not that we want to discourage people from sharing what they saw but sometimes some of these concerns can be addressed just simply by having this presentation so thank you for that um, a lot of my fellow board members have already brought up questions I had which is great my only other comment um, is on the very last part about limiting school drop-offs and I would say, as a parent, the more that this can be repeated by the principal and the PTA, um, as the, these are the rules for the school, and if your child forgets their lunch, this is what will happen. Um, I think the more effective it, it has potential for being, there will still be people who don't follow that <laughs> always, but um, I think lots of parents just need a reminder why it's a concern, why it, is, it, yeah. is problematic not just that you know we just don't want you in the building but there's a reason behind it um, and I think when people sometimes get that reminder they're more willing to cooperate that way yeah this, I, I'll just to, a quick comment that um, you know that this was a little eye-opening for me when we did uh, again part of the the security assessment this 
really did rise to the top as a, a concern for a lot of our, our building leaders, a lot of our principals. Um, and again, I um, we have a community group that, that Ron meets with periodically that um, has voiced concerns about safety and security issues and has asked to um, meet with our team, and it's been a good resource. And this was one thing that they, um, you know, again, was a little eye-opening for me when a community member said, well, what are you asking us to do? Um, you know, because you, you spend an hour talking about all that you've done, and man, you know, it, there's some tension there. And, and again, a lot of th these are these are parents who who um, are looking for reassurances and are a little um, concerned, and rightfully so. And, and at times, it gets a little defensive or, or a little uh, tense potentially when we talk about these things. But um, again, to be said, well, well, what are you asking us to do? And so, you know, we're, we're hopeful that that again, just by reiterating this message and and um, Again, not to say that we we um, you know want to you know prohibit drop offs or, or or say you know there's there's no reason to, to drop off. Obviously, there's medications and, and things that are maybe um, a little critical. But again, when we talk about um, teaching resilience and teaching flexibility and adaptivity, you know, having having a student learn that they can eat the school lunch and and will survive uh, could be a valuable lesson or. Um, Again, if we want to encourage people to remember their lunch, one way to do it is to have them forget it one day and not be bailed out by mom or dad. So uh, j just trying to think of, of how we can build these into not just, hey, this makes our, our community safer, but this also does tie back to um, some of the life lessons we're trying to incorporate in our, in our portrait of a graduate. As a parent who has been reminded occasionally by a staff member not to be a rescuer, uh, I'm sure my fellow board members are shocked to hear this. There are, there are benefits to our students as well, so thank you for reminding me again <laughs> as the school year starts. <laughs> I, I felt it. <laughs> and just to follow up a little bit, too, um, we are doing a back to school message, and um, it's meant to be a little bit lighter, but to hammer home some of these points like no tailgating and let's limit the amount of. Um, and, and kind of some of the, the dangers that go along with crossing guards and, and parents getting a little over exuberant driving to school because now we have three times as many cars pulling up to our schools that we ever had and, and it's just not, as Matt alluded to, it's not designed for that. So we have issues there that we need to make sure that we take care of and, and parents can be a big help with that, with both driving and others. So we will do that, that back to school message and. Um, try to make sure that that our staff which they've indicated to us and of course we want that their full support and their full attention is on the security of the building and not the 50 parents who come in for the first hour and bring things over not that that's not important but they've got things that they need to do to make sure the school day gets off safe and secure Ms. gents I want to thank you guys for this great presentation and also just the simple work that's being I mean, put in. Safety and security is an issue that's always changing. So I so appreciate the efforts that are being put in for all of our students. Uh, I had a, just a couple questions and honestly, they're really piggybacking what's already been said. Um, and actually what you just mentioned, Ron. The welcome back message, will that include a reminder about the new arrival dismissal procedure? Because Parent leaders were very confused slash not confused, not loving it at the end of the last school year. So just maybe a reminder to them. We will make sure we put that in. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> um, and the reason why we did Yes. It. And again, Simple I know when they hear it, it, yes, it's hard to really be angry about it. It makes total sense. I think there was just confusion for parents that volunteer a lot in the school, sure. kind of how that worked. So that's wonderful. And then uh, back to what Mr. Rising was saying was um, as far as like the line of communication that we'll be working on to get messages out, you know, about incidents and, and un understanding of the language, obviously you keep it very vague. Is it going to be though, um, at least for the school community, those parents surrounding it, a more immediate message? Because especially in high schools, it's parents seem to hear about something five seconds after you know kids are finding out. So they'll and then they kind of spread it in what they've heard. Or it's a horrible game of telephones. So I know I had spoken with Jeannie and Doug actually throughout the year about 
being having somebody that would be that almost point person to be able to get an immediate message out just even like everyone had said very vague um, I don't want to necessarily speak for Lisa Barry and Jeannie but mm -hmm. I know we have had discussions on um, that initial acknowledgement oftentimes when we have something happening we are trying to partner with our liaisons typically that's the police department so we have this unified message right because we don't want to even in the Granger incident we took some flack because ours was a little different than Aurora PD's even though they said the same thing mm -hmm. people questioned and it really was just both sides okay. so I think we we have been talking about the the crisis communication and just an initial acknowledgement that we know something's happening at XYZ school right. and we're aware of it we're working with that particular partner and we will provide an update as soon as possible so yes. that's something that we are going to look to do okay um, just to make sure that everybody knows like this is the channel we want you to be tuned into yes. to get that not yes. not the the social media account from somebody else exactly who's posting it. go to here or wherever that may be if we okay. drive them to our website if we push them to our social media pages mm -hmm. um, I don't know Lisa is there anything you want to add to that you good okay so that's kind of our plan going forward oh that's for great no that let that will just, be so good let me just add also unfortunately because the social media Be careful that what we put out as a school district, which can be picked up by the news, has to be as accurate as possible. Right. And so we want families to understand that we will get the information out as quickly as we can, mm -hmm. but they have to give us a moment of time. Right. So that we can make sure the information is accurate, because if, if we give out misinformation, then it comes back on us. Mm -hmm. And so um, school parents should know that we will be getting out the information as soon as possible. Yeah. But there is, it, it's a delay from when their children sends them well, a exactly, yes. message right. that may not be true. Um, Usually it's often not it accurate, is not. no. So I just want that to be known. No, and that's a very good point too, honestly. So maybe as that's coming along, parents hopefully will understand that it will be coming out very quickly. So whatever they think they're hearing, just sit on that and wait to see what's actually said. Thank you guys. That was it, that was easy, there we go. Well, thank you for all of the work here. It's, um, I, I appreciate the comments that you made um, to start the presentation, two in particular. One is that um, safety and security is a top priority for the district, for everyone that works here, for the board members. Um, it is a constant um, concern for us, and I hope we never have to witness some of the things that you read about that have happened in the country. Um, and also, the, that we can't give out all the details of what we do here. I mean, you gave a lot of information here that's very helpful and hopefully, um, uh, lets people have a better comfort level with what we are looking at, what we have in place. Um, but you know, we're not going to tell them all of the details of what we are doing in our schools. I think sometimes it's frustrating for us because we'll, um, we do mention safety and security a lot in different um, parts of our work as a board or a, in presentations, whether it's budget, the facilities plan, whatever but it's not constantly discussed. And sometimes when people hear us say, yeah, we really want new landscaping out there, they get frustrated like, what? And, you know, what about safety and security? It's like, it's always there, but we also have other needs also in the district. So um, I, it was important for you to say those words and I'm repeating them that the board always considers safety and security a top priority. So um, thank you, I think you did a great job presenting the information. I do appreciate also the um, instances that you pulled out to say here's some things that happened last year and what we're doing um, to make sure that we're prepared. So, so thank you. All right, anyone have any items for legislative advocacy or our Board of Education updates? No. All right, I need a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Yes. Any opposed?
Okay, we are adjourned. <laughs>